So good evening, everyone. This is Sibi James from ASQ. And I, uh, on behalf of ASQ, would like to welcome you all and thank you for joining us for this program on the human factor, breaking the service quality code to be presented by Prashant Thoskote. But before I introduce the speaker, I would like to speak a little about ASQ itself. Let me try moving this. So ASQ is, you know, 70 years in the, in the field of quality, formed in 1946, and we are present in now 140 countries all across the globe. And um, we have both corporate members and individual members, and essentially seek to promote the concepts of quality, quality thinking, business excellence, and essentially want to make the world a better place in whichever way our people, our members, are, um, uh, you know, members and uh, the communities in different parts of the world can. In India, we've been around for 20 years, and uh, we uh, work with some 350 corporate houses. We have uh, almost a 1,000 members across India. We have people taking our certifications, which essentially is about individual proficiency in the areas of quality in Six Sigma and Lean and in uh, different other fields of uh, quality, such as reliability and, uh, you know, operations excellence. And um, we provide training, we organize webinars and conferences, and um, we work with universities. There are some 50 universities with which we have some kind of interaction in India. One of the uh, uh, events that we organize annually is the SATIA, the South Asia Team Excellence Awards competition, where teams from different uh, leading organizations in India take part, and uh, they compete to win the uh, coveted uh, SATIA prize. And you can see the winners of the last few years. Now, 2019 was E. Clerk. They were the winner in uh, 2016 as well. Tara Steele, Ashok Leyland. And uh, just to give you an idea, some of the other webinars which are coming up as part of this uh, quality month for us, uh, Ronald Snee, ASQ fellow, uh, founder of Snee Associates, going to speak about the use of data in improving business performance, November 28th, 6 p.m. We have a confirmation, but we haven't fixed the date as yet for Joseph uh, DeFeo, chairman of Juran Institute. He will um, be speaking as well sometime, and we'll let you know when. And we have a couple of panel discussions, one on November 28th, Saturday at 10 a.m. This is part of the uh, LMC, the, the uh, local member community in Ahmedabad. They've organized this as part of their annual conference. And then we have on Sunday the 29th, we have another panel discussion on Six Sigma Future Directions. And uh, if you missed any of the previous master classes that we've been holding over the last so many months, you can get to the YouTube channel of ASQ South Asia or get to our homepage and uh, you can get linked to these various uh, videos which will, um, which are, you know, the output of eminent speakers. So I now would like to uh, introduce the, our speaker for today, Prashant Hoskote. And uh, Prashant Puskote is uh, president and lead um, LNS custodian for uh, striking ideas. And LNS stands for uh, um, loyalty and sacrifice. And he's going to speak about uh, uh, the human factor. And uh, what he's saying is that the human connection is in service should be a way of life. It's really a part of our human, humaneness itself. Uh, Prashant has over 30 years of expertise in the quality and customer experience space. And uh, he has um, contributed in the areas of business excellence, business process management, innovation management, uh, along with digital transformation, Lean Six Sigma, and so on. And he's been a senior director, quality, service excellence, and innovation for the Max Group contributed very significantly both to his own organization as well as to the industry in general. So uh, 
Prashant has been recognized among the 50 most talented quality professionals, citation at the World Quality Congress. And uh, he has featured as one of the front runners in the executive focus column of Business India. So um, we are fortunate to have Prashant Hoskote with us today. And I shall hand over the mic and the uh, platform to him as soon as I can do so. Just handing it over to you. Just give me a minute. Reading the presentation. Yeah, I'm just looking for that. Um, how do I get the list of panelists? Uh, you have the you have the, uh, the icon right at the bottom. Um, it says participants. You go there, maybe. You're right. Okay, you can see the panelists now. You got it. Do I have a presentation? Over to you, yes. Okay. Is my screen visible? Is it? Yes, it is visible. Okay. <clears throat>
opportunity and this platform to speak on and share our thoughts. Uh, I think all of us in the MSQ are truly living up to the tagline, the global voice of quality, with uh, so many events being organized by them across the world. Before I forget, wish you all a very, very, very happy World Quality Month. Uh, I wish it was not just one month and uh, it was almost every day and I think it's becoming that almost worldwide, especially these days. What's interesting is COVID but otherwise this month has been celebrated with as much enthusiasm as every year and that's a very, very good sign indeed across the world. Okay, so before I go ahead and uh, uh, sort of actually get into the, into the, into the webinar and the topic itself, to me, the two most important words in the theme of this talk are movement and service. So at the outset, let me indulge you with a short three-minute video that provides a backdrop for some references, and I'll bring that in my talk as well later. And so the human factor will always be retained 
as the central core eternally in any business that deep down has come as some shred of caring. Over the years, the human factor has been tossed around. Truly, let me explain. Much has been written and discussed on the difference between a manufacturing economy that is strictly about mass production, capability, tolerance for deviation, and efficiency. In contrast, the service economy is about human character, individuality, unique experiences, and such softer dimensions. I'm actually reminded of Antonio's last words in the movie Ratatouille to the chef seeking his dessert preference. Surprise me, he said. Where on earth can you find this eternal joy of serving and the joy of being served? Going back to the early days of mass production in the manufacturing realm where EQM's evolution had its first foothold. It is no secret that Henry Ford desired the workforce's hands and not their heads or their hearts. It is said that their heads and hearts were considered not only irrelevant, but often problematic. In the book Human Sigma by John Fleming and Jim Asplund, this is referenced rather well in the book Human Sigma. In the opening chapters, if you have an interest in reading books, you must read this one. Scholars have discussed and written about how TQM was much more suitable for manufacturing. The intensity of using variation and pursuing capacity or scalability, therefore the human factor was always relegated to a lower priority. Accordingly, adopting TQM to the service side of the business had to be evolved. I'm tempted to share my personal story at this point to illustrate this. An exciting episode, I must say, and that happened to me. I had just joined this organization several years ago, the top class luxury service company. I would instead leave it anonymous, but by the time I finish this story, some would guess the company's name. But let me say the essence of learning is the story and not the company name itself. Having joined this high-end, world-class, luxury, iconic hospitality group, I was doing the induction rounds, getting to meet one of all the C-suite in the company. I recall meeting this iconic personality who was the chief operating officer of the luxury division. An admirable personality in the company who had come up the ranks. I heard him saying, oh, so it's you who's joined as the head of service quality. Let's take a seat. Now came his first and the only question. Prashant, what business do you think we are in? So I said, hospitality. He said, no. I gave other chance. I said, uh, hotels. He smiled and said, no. Just then the phone rang and he took the call and I was relieved to find some space to think. My mind was raised to find this simple answer. He finished his call and our eyes met again. He asked with a smile, so you find the answer? And I said, no, not sure what you mean. So he goes, we're actually in the business of massaging the egos of customers. So come back and see me in one month. That's where my feeling. I was flustered, flabbergasted, confused maybe. How much should we do this massaging? Why should we do it? Can we do it consistently? All the kind of questions that bubbled in my mind. Therefore, you need systems, you need processes, you need best practices, you need people trained to deliver those best practices and systems and processes and so on. It was this way of provoking my mind to break the service code. Working in the luxury hotel setup, I also learned that genuine care was the foundation. One can't just fake it. Ampering the ego then was just an outcome, not a corporate mandate. This awareness was now within me. And many years later, I was in a small street shop and the shopkeeper spoke to a visiting customer. How are you, Mr. Sahagi? How was your 
trip to the school admission for your son. This was said, by the way, in the presence of three other customers at the shop. Can you imagine how important Mr. Sarangi would feel? In small mom and pop stores, customer centricity comes naturally to those who are genuinely customer oriented. One does not have to break the service code. POC is now an acronym for the customer's voice, and this shop owner is perhaps oblivious to this fancy term that B2B and B2C companies struggle to emulate in the voice of the customer. Customer centricity. This street shop owner and his patron cared very little about open disclosure of his customer's personal information and name. Understanding service reminds me of an excerpt from a book. Listen to this one. Rogan Calais book excerpt Loyalty and Sacrifice. Ushering new horizons for business leaders in the digital age. On one occasion, I found myself engaged in a conversation with a colleague, a consummate hotelier. Our chat circled around what service indeed is. This was my attempt to get to the bottom of how one truly comprehends the depths of service. Where does one draw inspiration for service? He asked me, as a child, do you recall ever running a fever? And then your mother taking care of you? Promptly, I responded, yes, I remember that. My mum supported and comforted me while I was sick and in pain. Then he asked me, did you thank her for the service that she rented? I said, gosh, no, not precisely at the time. He pushed further. Did you give her a five-star rating? He went on, and his remarks made me perceive the esoteric nature of service. That it was something spiritual. I realized that service is not about a transactional mindset. It is embedded in the very mental and attitude or makeup of those who love to serve. Hospitality is inspired subliminally by what humanity has to offer. You can never substitute the care and affection that family bonds exude in a relationship. And yet it is these human values that inspire those in the hospitality and service business and drive them to act with a passion to serve. Much like boss to a plan. Oh, there's so much to unpack here, isn't it? This is a book that I will refer to later in the presentation. And it's a book that breaks a 200 year old norm that businesses and enterprises have followed. Thank you for your service. It is now a term that conjures up images of war veterans. Rightly so, their loyalty and sacrifice are always beyond words. The business world has welcomed all that they can learn from military and war generals, be it in the art of war from the times of Sun Tzu, and modern warfare, warfare terms like VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, it's come from the military, it comes from the armed forces. Breaking the service code is evident in this fantastic example. Stanley Ellen Patricio, I hope I'm pronouncing the name well, is a retired United States Army General, best known for his command of Joint Special Operations Command, JSOC in the mid 2000s. His take on what resilience is rather insightful in this expectation. He says to troops, and when they, the troops, I mean, get to the ground and will find that the order he gave was wrong, he expects them to execute the order he should have given. Think about that. The order that he should have given. Oh, that blows me away. I thought in the business world, that would be called empowerment. But then he is discussing resilience. What we should we make of this? Perhaps empowerment is just an expected norm, almost a given. Well, Stanley Allen Macrosu just wrote the service code for business enterprises. Those interested should read his book, Team of Themes, New Rules of Engagement for a Complex World. I'm sure many of you are from call centers 
and would have mirrors in the front of your associate and colleagues for you to make sure that you smile at your face. That's a way of making you making sure you smile. Customers can feel your smile. There is some science behind it. All this effort to empower you to smile or resilience to get by. I'm reminded of another episode that I that I experienced in another organization that I worked for back this time. I was walking through processes. I probably would do that, observing the processes quietly. I would typically try to watch and understand what's happening and observe people. Watch what they're doing, what they're not doing. I found that the staff could hardly smile at the customer. They had almost no eye contact with the customer. When I saw that and I realized that these people aren't smiling, I stopped to look at what was happening. I still realized that they're all lovely people, but they can't smile. And they can't have eye contact because of the number of things that they are doing on their desk. Sometimes non-value adding activities are so many that they don't have the time to look up and smile and greet them and have a proper service experience kind of conversation with them. So what needs to be fixed? Employee's attitude, meaning, systems, penalizing, processes, what comes first? I recently got a few of my team members who are experts on using the problem solving methodology because I seem to soon realize that uh, slightly more complex tools such as Six Sigma weren't required in a situation like that. And that's a lesson for any of us listening. We don't need to use the same tool for all kinds of problems. There's a problem design which tool to use and which methodology to use. Anyway, the, the team helped the line staff improve the processes, eliminate all the non value adding activities in the process, repetitive actions, and drastically freed up their time. It might have taken about a couple of months to fix the process, but when it did happen, I could see the astronomical change in how they behaved with the customer. It's what? That team's customer satisfaction scores at a process level shot up dramatically. Think for a moment of your arm, your forearm. The training and you know the pleasantries that you do, the top line, the standard phraseology and what you wear, the grooming and so on, all extremely important, but they are the skin and the forearm muscles. The bone of the forearm is the process. If you don't get your process right, no amount of you beautifying your forearm and doing your exercises and building your muscles with dumbbells and what have you is going to help because the bone is fundamentally weak. At times I wonder, is service excellence journey actually a service excellence journey or is it a change management journey? What are we really doing? In my view, it's it's more of a change management journey. This is about changing people. I don't mean eliminating them, but changing the way they think, how they do things, and so on. And about managing change at the top. That stuff, you know, that only. It is overcoming resistance to change at multiple levels. If the resistance comes from the topmost level, i.e., the CEO themselves, you have a problem, a big problem. Well, work with the CEO. Speak his language to make him understand why you must make this change. As to Dr. Duran, who would say top management speaks the language of money. Workforce talks the language of things. And many managers must be bilingual. They have to be able to communicate with both groups. Try talking to the CEO in the language of money versus in the language of things. Turnaround time will improve by 80%. Response time will improve by 35%. Minutes. Errors have reduced by 60%. So, say, so what? What's your point? A few years ago, I once came across a situation where a company's service quality head it would present to the board that their complaint management process was a 2.2 sigma process. I said, hey, you know what? You're talking to the board. I said, well, the board needs to understand this language. I said, no, you need to understand their language. a long story short, you presented to the board, it's 2.2 sigma. 
they thought the board members started looking at each other. I don't think that person lasted in that role for too many after that. Obviously, he did not speak the language of business. You can't manage change if you don't understand the business. You can't handle change if you don't speak that language. That's top management. At the great quality group that I mentioned earlier, Dr. Durand famously said, look after the process and the product will look after itself. I repeat, look after the process and the product will look after itself. Product here is also defined as goods and services. So think about that. It applies anywhere, even in your life. Look after the process of baking biryani and it will turn out well. Look after the process of how you practice for your tennis and your tennis will turn out well. So the two key words here are process, product. The process is only as good as the people behind it. If the process cannot infuse human goodness, demand, the product will be less worthy to that extent. The world witnessed the evolution of business excellence or organizational excellence frameworks that has been used for nearly 40 years now. The world has also witnessed incredible progress in digital. Now Siri and Alexa are learning to emulate human-like conversational skills. The same pattern from Henry Ford's time about head and heart but not considered only irrelevant but often problematic, the very same pattern has repeated itself. The digital infusion in processes took the humanity out of the process and now the world is scrambling to bring the human touch back into the mix. At many levels, we recognize that whenever there is human interaction, there is an opportunity to create experiences through collaboration, accommodation, and adjustment. Enterprises are not machines. They are living, breathing organizations in all areas. Wherever there is an opportunity to nurture a human touch to enrich people, enhance the brand, and touch the community, the human factor should and will prevail. Like a living organism, organizations aspire for success, strive towards excellence, pledge commitments for a cause, promote and abide by values and commit to a shared vision. Someday, do all of this. The diagram behind, or rather between, a regimented business excellence structure gets actually a flexible approach to the best, to get the best out of people for business excellence practices is fascinating. I came across an HBR article, rather, how our business will give. How to give your people essential direction without shutting them down under the title Structure That's Not Stifling. Let me read the article summary and I encourage you to read the full article on the HBR website for the summary. Most leaders view employee freedom and operational controls as antagonists in the tug of war. They tend to focus on regulating workers behavior, often putting a damper on commitment, innovation, and performance without realizing it. But freedom and control aren't zero-sum, argues the author. By giving people a clear sense of their organization's purpose, priorities, and principles, that is, by providing freedom within a galvanizing framework, leaders can equip employees to make on the ground decisions that are in the company's best interest. Gulati uses businesses as diverse as Netflix, Alaska Airlines, and Warby Parker. He shows how freedom, freedom, by the way, the word freedom, I love that, can function in different settings. A coherent framework helps employees develop a deeper understanding of the business leading to improved engagement, creativity, efficiency, and customer service. I almost insist you read this article. It's available on the HBR website. At Striking Ideas, we have designed a new approach that allows a malleable structure in the loyalty systems. 
It's a new blueprint for success based on the LNS loyalty and sacrifice principles. Proposed in the book, loyalty and sacrifice, ushering new horizons for business leaders. Interestingly, the term of war described in the HBR article is addressed in many ways. We find that leaders in their organizations are indeed destiny shapers, as we understand the two dimensions of running the business and changing the business. And yet, not all leaders are interested in change. Some are more passionate about running it well. That's their company boards and the business circumstances has little appetite to assuring change. But then over time, everything is subject to change, don't you think? The LNS executive briefing and the LNS experts hurdle is about allowing destiny shapers to usher a new vantage point. We bring a uniform definition of loyalty proposed in the book, Loyalty and Sacrifice, ushering new horizons for business leaders in the digital age. Based on the four LNS principles in the book, c engagements to improve loyalty systems for business enterprises are underway with dedicated LNS executive leadership briefing and the experts are to develop loyalty systems to improve business results. The LNS philosophy is timely, as observed by various industry leaders, for three reasons. First, advancements in big data power, AI maps, human behaviors to anticipate hyper-personalized experiences. Second, catapulting progress can be achieved by harnessing the digital powers with the uniform loyalty definition. And third, lastly, the 2020 global pandemic has touched every aspect of humanity. Do you agree? The sense of reverence echoed in many ways underpins the need to engage with the LNS principles in terms of sustaining, building, and improving relationships. Organizations are, organizations are typically in a dilemma. Most times, the dilemma is about we seek to understand quality processes, management of processes, business processes, service process, and stuff like that. But what's distinct about service? How do I exactly improve service, customer service? What is it that I need to do? Now, there's a whole lot of things one can do, but where do I find something that I can implement? There seems to be some structure as far as quality is concerned. There are methodologies, tools, techniques, and so on. But what do we do for service? Of course, there are many service gurus in the marketplace, and they rely on their own rich experience to provide guidance and consulting. With all due respect to them, I say this, they are great stalwarts and experts in the media. It is, however, my view that the business excellence frameworks have a robust improvement grammar in it. I mean that the business excellence frameworks have all the vocabulary and methods available for making the best of it. One can infuse the experience of stalwarts so long as they bring a new context to further the conversation. The frameworks have all the parameters related to customers and service that we have to look and read between the lines and look deeper to understand what parts of this framework and the questions asked in the framework are relevant to service in general terms and customer service in a specific way to delight the customer. Business excellence frameworks have all the ingredients in it to help develop an improvement roadmap, service improvement roadmap. There indeed is a method in this matter, therefore. As I mentioned earlier, there is a considerable component of employees too. Employees as a word is sprinkled all over the framework, as you all know. You've got to find where they are and what they're asking for and build a service excellent journey around that. Such internal strengths in the PE frameworks exist. The language of the framework has a better to it. <laughs> so while the business excellence frameworks have been around for nearly 40 years, it needs some alteration, not in its methods, but its context. I make a fundamental difference in the BE framework's relevance. It has a structure with methods as its internal strength. It also has sources that set the data for its context. The latter is under siege as a slow-moving glacier. That is the reason why 
Fortune 50 or even Fortune 100 corporations are the adopters of the entire business excellence framework. The world is far more complicated than it was 40 years ago. Human forces are penetrating their way into the broad world agenda. In fact, a striking idea is the modern 21st century philosophy that we have embraced, and many global leaders have found it relevant, is the realm of the BE context. The BE framework or the business excellence framework absorbs the new provocation as actually pertinent to its business. The power of the framework will be used and is being used. The BE framework gets enhanced by a new context as we deploy the LNS loyalty systems. For those interested, we will be happy to engage separately. With this fascinating new conversation that alters the human factor and influences in breaking the service code, we are building an ecosystem of LNS custodians or, shall I say, our affiliates to serve the C suite worldwide by breaking this new concept. The overall point here is that the BE framework is robust in its method. It may need some infusion of new age relevant context, which is already happening. The company's boards need assurance and a platform to connect the dots. I'm actually reminded of one of the experiences I had in one of my earlier organizations that I worked for. Despite my resistance at the CEO council, Meeting one of the top brass proposed that we needed some service excellence framework. Many frown faces and most eyes turned to me. As the chair of the Quality Council, Corporate Quality Council, and the CEO said, Hey, aren't we already using a universally accepted organizational framework? We used to use the Borders framework, by the way. So why do we need yet another framework now? How do you expect my employees to understand multiple frameworks, tools, methodologies, etc.? You will confuse them. That was precisely my point, but my CEO came to my rescue. The issue was crushed and we stuck to one framework. And guess what? It made a whole lot of difference on our metrics started to go in the right direction. Whether it's the customer metric, the employees metric, the finance metric, the process metric, all of them started to go in the right direction. The title of this webinar also might have discouraged folks from manufacturing industry building. I hope some manufacturing folks are listening in right now, or we hopefully listen to it later and post it on social media. In my experience in the manufacturing world, manufacturing is where things probably go the best. The manufacturing function, I think. Because they know how to measure, improve, control. They work with formulas, they work with machines. They can't but not learn measurement, improvement, analysis, monitoring, controls, and so on. It is the support function where the problem is. I dare say, for maybe for 40% of the problems, the root cause of the problems are pre manufacturing, and maybe about 20% are post manufacturing. I mean, that would be. Of course, a few percentages up and down, so don't, don't take me exactly for those percentages. But the point is, there is a lot of scope for improvement and improvement in service in support functions such as finance, purchase, marketing, sales. Talking of sales, get four salespeople in four different corners of the room and ask them to explain the sales process. And don't be too surprised if the responses are inconsistent. And if so, you have a big problem. They still might be, by the way, meeting sales targets. In fact, I was with someone from a manufacturing company over the weekend, and we visited one of the dealership shops just as a surprise. He was at that shop, and he said, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm on vacation now, actually, but uh, I just thought I'd spend some time with you guys. So um, he's now bored out there with a list of star employees of the month last six months, so he called out those people and asked if we could meet those people over a meeting for coffee. And of course, they came with a great amount of optimism to meet this gentleman. One of the first things he asked them was, explain to me how you sell, what do you do? You're a star performer, so I'm sure you have some great best practices. What do you actually tell the customer? And 
guess what is strong? They were probably the worst sales that he had ever met. But they were still managed to beat them on their numbers, in fact, exceed it. They would somehow manage to sell the product. You think those customers who were almost forced to buy the product would ever buy that product again? Not a chance. So it's non manufacturing functions which you've got to be very careful. That is where service is so, so important. I wonder how, how many of you actually do something called a internal voice of customer survey, i.e., line functions giving feedback to support functions on how well they are supporting the line function. If you are, that's great, it's fantastic. If you are not, I would strongly recommend it. The survey outcome typically leads to formal service level agreements between support functions and line functions. HR and the line function, for example, purchase and the line function, accounting and the line function, and so on, marketing and line function. Necessary to do this because it's all about organizational excellence. It's all about making it happen for the customer together. In closing, let me conclude that we touched upon probably three big points. How relevant are the existing organizational excellence framework? Can they be used to develop service excellence roadmap? Is it what is it about service excellence management or change management? I sincerely hope we have provided some insights to ponder over these three questions. We'd be happy to discuss anything that's been discussed here, uh, and you can contact us at www.loyaltyassistance.com slash contact is our website. In conclusion, <laughs> we wish to leave you with a proposal thought about the next concept on text. To fuel the V framework, the V framework's evolution is robust in terms of its method. The new horizons for business leaders and inclusion of the new context of the V framework captured in this short video with help scattered programs. Here you go. Thanks. Um... Thanks, Prashant. That was a brilliant uh, presentation on uh, this new concept of loyalty and how that can add value to the entire business excellence uh, structure and framework and how that gets implemented in organizations. So thank you for that. Um, I had a couple of questions here. Uh, the first was, was, you know, that um, often some people say that the spirit of service is not natural to uh, many individuals, not natural to certain communities. Uh, what would you say about that kind of view? Sorry, I lost you in between. Could you repeat that? So I was saying uh, the question was, you know, some people might say that, you know, the spirit of service itself uh -huh. is not natural to some of us and not natural to certain groups among us and so on. Any comments on that? That is uh, to an extent true. If you ask me, uh, not everyone can be fantastic at all roles, is it? Uh, it it's it's um, quite um, straight in that sense. However, uh, you know, you might then wonder how is it that companies that are doing really well on service are doing it so consistently? What do they do? What's the magic? And I've, I've actually, you know, I'm so glad you asked this question because I, some years ago, did a quiet research, um, nothing formal. I do keep doing these things on my own. But I studied about, uh, I think, 12 uh, service organizations, top class service organizations, to find out why are they where they are? You know, what do they do differently? I actually spoke to some of their people um, uh, and, and when I give you the response, there were of course several other things, but one one commonality that came across across almost all these organizations was the way they recruit their people. Uh, the way they recruit their people. They are very, mm -hmm. very careful about getting the right kind of people and the right culture from day one. I mean, it's, 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 it's like saying, you know, you can't convert a rock into a diamond, right? But you can convert mm -hmm. a rough diamond into a, into a nice polished one. So yeah. that, that's not as if to say, uh, what do I do with the rocks then? Are you saying you just discard them? Of course not. They probably will be good somewhere else in a different kind of role, but not for my company. Tough life, buddy. 
uh, you, you are damn good somewhere else, but it's not really fitting in here. That's the kind of a tough goal that sometimes one needs to take. Um, but that's one of the things I believe we should do. Uh, I, I know this company who give almost 30 to 40 percent of their weight on uh, on on um, yes, trying to you know uh, make sure that the service orientation is there in their people. You know when the recruitment is happening, the service orientation. So that probably gives you a few points to talk about. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, that was nice. Um, by the way, if anyone, anyone has questions, you can send it to me on the chat box. There was one other question on, um, you know, you spoke about uh, the applicability of these concepts to the call centers, to even to manufacturing organizations. Yeah. So uh, any uh, pointers to which, which sectors do you think or which particular industry or uh, part of the uh, delivery of organizations, which part will this will uh, most benefit from these ideas? Actually, any, if you ask me, B2C, B2B, any kind. I, I was um, with a group recently, uh, as you know, uh, uh, which one mm -hmm. of the companies in that group was a B2B company. And uh, even in a company such as that, we, we said, hey, you know what? Um, production is doing their job, but it's the non-production department that probably should uh, tie in very well with what they're doing to really make sure that the customer at the end of the process is truly delighted. So uh, it, it, it's just there. It's, it's not uh, restricted to any particular kind. Uh, it's universally applicable. Mm -hmm. And what, what do you think is a contribution of, uh, you know, the new tools, um, apart from software itself, Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence and uh, big data analysis. Where do those uh, tools and uh, resources come in in terms of these these implementations? Interesting. Um, well, that's going to be there. Well, that's not going to be. It's already the next big thing, isn't it? Um, uh, you you name it, and you almost get scared to talk anything at your home because Alexa is listening. You know, so uh, it's 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 that scary. But the point I'm making is that. Um, uh, it is going to be the next big thing, and uh, therefore this argument about where is human touch going and so on. But you know what? What I also believe, though, is that even in companies which are implementing AI and ML and stuff like that, um, they have to make sure that the human element is not is not missed out. And to to, to make sure that is happening, they're trying to get these instruments as close to the humans as possible. Um, psychology students are being recruited by some of the IT companies just to understand human psychology and therefore map how people think into machines so that the robots who are doing RPA can probably think like a person and respond like a person at a call center, you know, as close as that is possible. So, uh, I still believe the human angle should not be sacrificed or should not be uh, cut at all uh, because that will be a disaster. That will really be a disaster. I mean, maybe I have a bias because I come from a very, um, uh, you, you know, service driven and a very human kind of uh, background uh, because of the company that I work for. But I sincerely believe that shouldn't happen. Thanks. Uh, let me just uh, ask if there's any other question from the audience and what I'll do is I'll try and unmute everybody in case you know if you want to speak and we'll be okay so um Thanks, uh, uh, thanks, Prashant. That was a, a you know wonderful presentation. Uh, gave uh, brought in and compiled many new insights. I think you put a great framework together around it as well. Yeah. And I wish you all the best in taking it forward to the industry and beyond. Thank you so much to all the audience who joined us today and to those who would be watching this video later on as well. Once again, a happy quality month and a quality year and quality every day in your lives.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sidhu. Thanks very much. Allow me to say a quick thank you to all the participants who are connected, as well as those who couldn't for whatever reason. Uh, hope you like what you see when you connect uh, to this presentation later on social media. Good luck and have a lovely day and a uh, rest of the month and rest of your uh, tenure with, with uh, any corporate you are in. Thank you. All the best. Thank you.